China's diplomatic relationship with African countries goes back 60 years. In the meantime, the world has changed, and so have China and Africa. But what remains unchanged is a deep bond of friendship, mutual trust, and mutual support between China and Africa. Mutual trust and mutual support between China and Africa. Now, as Foreign Minister Wang Yi addressed the media after wrapping up China's two sessions, that was his message to Africa. And as China starts shifting towards its new normal for economic growth rates, this could be Africa's chance to truly reap the benefits of win-win cooperation. And with higher cooperation comes more media interest, something that became evident by the increased African media presence during this year's political season. So is Africa's growing press interest in China a sign of more good things to come? And what role can the continent play in China's diplomacy in 2016? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now, days before the forum on China-Africa cooperation last year, the China-Africa Media Summit was held in Cape Town. Chiang Chuang Huo, Minister of State Council Information Office of China, stressed the importance of enhancing the role of media in promoting friendship and mutual understanding between the Chinese and the African peoples. Now, three months later, this message seems to have been put into action. Last week, the fourth session of the 12th National People's Congress held a press conference with Foreign Minister Wang Yi, where two African journalists took the opportunity to ask questions on China's foreign relations. Let's listen in to what they had to say. Good morning, Minister. As China's economy has been slowing down, we've seen a drop in commodity demand. Some people say that this will affect the relationship in terms of economic cooperation and development aid to Africa. Last year at the Forum for China-Africa Co Cooperation meeting in Johannesburg, President Xi Jinping had committed about a billion US dollars towards foreign direct investment into Africa by 2020. Is this still going to be the case in, in terms of the slowing down global economy? Thank you. China's diplomatic relationship with African countries goes back 60 years. In the meantime, the world has changed, and so have China and Africa. But what remains unchanged is a deep bond of friendship, mutual trust, and mutual support between China and Africa. At the end of last year, President Xi announced 10 cooperation plans for China and Africa. The most salient feature of these plans is that we want to transition from a trade pattern that is so far dominated by resource products to more investment and industrial cooperation. By encouraging more Chinese businesses to invest in Africa, we want to help the continent accelerate its industrialization and boost its capacity for development. So these plans cannot come at a better time. They are designed precisely to help Africa deal with the new challenges from the international economic situation. Whenever China makes a promise, it always delivers. Just three months after the China-Africa summit, we have got into touch with over 20 African countries to follow up on the summit outcomes. A number of early harvest items will soon materialize, and the China-Africa Fund for Industrial Cooperation is already up and running. For many years, there are all kinds of comments about China-Africa cooperation in the world, but the African people know the best. At last year's summit, many African leaders stated publicly that China has never colonized Africa, rather China has helped Africa to emerge from poverty, realize development, and China has brought new life to Africa. They also said that Africa has been searching for a truly dependable partner with common interests. Eventually, they found such a partner in China. These statements struck a chord with many in the audience, and in my view, the African leaders spoke the mind of the African people. Good morning, Minister. My name is Mohammed from Yom Seba, Egyptian newspaper. On the beginning uh, of this year, Chinese president made his first visit to the Middle East 
that was happening on the background of Iran and Saudi Arabia, conflict intensified. Then the visit mean China was adjusting its Middle East policy. Thank you. When it comes to Middle East affairs, China has never been a mere onlooker. Rather, we have all along supported the Arab countries' quest for independence and liberation. We enjoy ever closer economic and trade ties with the region, and we are contributing actively to peace and stability in the Middle East. China does not seek a sphere of influence in the Middle East, nor do we look for any proxies. Our approach is the opposite. We adopt an objective and impartial attitude. We try to facilitate peace talks, and our position is selfless and above board. This is China's unique strength, and so all the countries in the Middle East welcome and look to China to play a bigger role. At the start of this year, President Xi Jinping chose the Middle East for his first overseas trip. He made a historic visit to Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Iran, and opened a new chapter of relations between China and the Middle East. If there is any change in China's policy towards the region, it is that in the context of building the Belt and Road, we want to play a more active role and deepen win-win cooperation with countries in the Middle East, and that. On the basis of not interfering in other countries' internal affairs, we want to play a more active role in seeking the political settlement of burning issues in the region. Well, to help make sense of Africa's growing interest in Chinese affairs and the role the continents can play in Chinese diplomacy, CCTV's Wang Hui sat down with Liu Guijin, a former special representative of the Chinese government on African affairs, as well as a former ambassador to South Africa. What's China's policy towards Africa this year, especially after President Xi's visit to Egypt? What's the message delivered by this trip? The Chinese foreign policy towards Africa could be summed up in four Chinese characters. That is, uh, uh, real, that is sincerity, real results, affinity, and good faith, which reflects the genuine I mean, sentiment and uh, uh, long traditional friendship between China and Africa. Uh, we have to mention two milestone events. Uh, in the past uh, three months. One was uh, in the, uh, the, the, the Falkirk Summit, which was convened in South Africa, Johannesburg. That was the first time the summit of Falkirk, China-Africa Cooperation Forum, to be convened in Africa. And uh, that conference was uh, really a great success. And it was well attended by over 50 uh, around 50 African leaders and their representatives. Uh, the Chinese and African leaders unanimously agree to upgrade their relations into the comprehensive and strategic cooperative partnership. And uh, that reflects the new level of China-Africa friendship and cooperation. Another big event is uh, in this January President Xi Jinping visited uh, uh, Egypt and he addressed uh, the uh, Arab League. Uh, and uh, in this, during these two visits, uh, we sent strong messages to the outside world that uh, uh, the great importance attached by the Chinese government to its relationship with Africa as well as with uh, Arabic countries will remain unchanged and be further developed. As you know that uh, South Africa is the uh, strongest economy uh, where immediately after Nigeria, but actually its uh, economic basis is much better than Nigeria, and that is a big country in sub-Saharan Africa. And Egypt is uh, an uh, African country, an Arabic country, and a Middle East country. So President Xi Jinping's state visit to these two countries a uh, really, you know, uh, kind of milestone event, and uh, President Xi committed uh, a, a series of, uh, I mean, policy measures to uh, support uh, the development of uh, of Africa. 
Well, we have seen African journalists covering the two sessions in Beijing this year. Two of them raised their questions at foreign ministers' press conference. Why is the African media becoming more and more interested in China? Uh, well, I remember that uh, during the Joburg summit, a lot of African leaders made it clear that, uh, uh, and, and they, they spoke uh, publicly that uh, for a long time, they have been trying to seek uh, uh, a good partner uh, in the world based on uh, common interests. Now Lily has found that p reliable partner and that is China because China has never colonized Africa and China has always regarded Africa as brothers and sisters and treated African countries uh, with uh, equality and sincerity. Uh, the the so, so I think that is the understanding uh, of the African countries about uh, China and, and Africa uh, co cooperation. And uh, so, so the African countries has that request and demand from the bottom of their heart to further uh, develop their relations with, with, with China. And on the Chinese side, uh, we have always regarded Africa uh, as our uh, equal partners in the world. The two sides has, uh, has a common ground, a lot of common ground, and held and hold I mean, similar views on a lot of international arenas. So that serves to be the good basis for China and Africa to further uh, consolidate uh, their, their friendship and work together for the shared destiny of common, uh, uh, common interests. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, my expert guests will help unpack Africa's role in China's diplomacy. Stay with us. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now, to help us understand African media's growing interest in China, as well as the continent's role in China's diplomacy, I have expert guests standing by in Nairobi, a political analyst, Masharia Munene, in Johannesburg, Dr. Bob Wekesa, he's a research associate at the University of Witwatersrand, and in Beijing, Dr. Yao Yao, he's a director of research at the China Public Diplomacy Association. Thank you all for joining in this conversation. Uh, Dr. Wekesa, let me start off with you, though. We have seen for the first time growing interest by uh, African media in developments, especially political developments in China. Is there a growing interest in your view? Is there a growing interest by Africa's media on developments in China and why? Right. Uh, yes, obviously there's been a great interest in uh, developments in China on the economic front because, um, as we well know now, uh, China is recalibrating and reconfiguring its uh, economic model away from uh, volumes and quantity to a more qualitative and uh, you know high high value uh, economic model and um, for instance just as an example uh, China is looking to cut down on its overcapacity industrial manufacturing units and um, that would mean therefore that uh, China might be looking at less of importation of minerals from African countries and uh, don't you forget that uh, many African countries are right. reliant on their natural resources for their economic development. Uh, and and, and, and uh, you know, when um, China, a huge big economy, the second largest economy in the world, kind of uh, undergoes a reform and transformation of its economic model, it will have definitely an impact on African economies. Uh, if, if you just look at a single factor, such as the fact that China is the biggest economic partner of the African continent, then definitely there will be great interest in what is happening in China on the economic front. There's great interest on what is happening in China on the economic front. Dr. Yao in Beijing, though, how do journalists, particularly African journalists, in your view, how do they perceive developments in China? Yeah, uh, I think on the one hand, it shows the more and more important role of China on the international stage. And on the other hand, I think it shows that maybe in the past, 
all of China and Africa are uh, traditional friends. But uh, in, term, uh, in terms of ordinary people, maybe we don't know each other so well. Uh, actually, I can give you an example. Uh, during the past two years, uh, under the framework of the FOCAC, uh, there is a program named the China African uh, Press Center, which is based in Beijing and organized by my association, China Public Diplomacy Association. Uh, during the past two years, we have already supported and invited three groups of African journalists from more than right. 10 African countries. Uh, these uh, journalists came to Beijing and stayed in China for half a year, and they participated in various of uh, news events and witnessed the change every day in China and observed the China-African cooperation every day with their own eyes. Uh, that is very important uh, because in the past, you know, due to the budget limitation, right. uh, most African media cannot send as many correspondents as Western media to China. Uh, so for most of the African people, they get information about China mainly from the Western media, which always give a wrong image of China. So uh, actually, I, I can <coughs> see that uh, most of the journalists came to Beijing they said before that they really know China too little. I'm going to jump yeah. in here very briefly because I also want to get uh, uh, Professor Macharia's input yeah. in this. Though it, it does mean uh, going back to those questions uh, asked by the African journalists, it does mean that there is a lot of growing interest, not just by mm -hmm. African media but African governments and African people as well. What is your take on that? Well, it is very good that that is happening. For one, China is so big. Uh, that you cannot ignore it even if you wanted to. Uh, China is present almost everywhere. And it is in the interest of the African governments and African media to be knowledgeable about this economy that is now the second biggest in the world and with the possibility of becoming the biggest. Uh, and they're so big in many other ways that since it is there, it is in the interest of the African people to know more and more about China. And so the African media have an obligation to their people to understand China so that they can explain it to the people. And so when they interact, they know what is going on. As for government officials, it is in their interest to know more and more about the Chinese thinking, the Chinese policy making uh, procedures, so that when they meet, they can discuss on a more fair uh, level. Uh, the problem that comes up is when one side does not seem to know what is the thinking on the other side. Uh, that, that then becomes a discussion between an equals. So what, uh, the, the interesting uh, being developed by the African media and the African policy makers is for the mutual benefits of two sides so that no, no side will feel as if it was shortchanged in the long run. Dr. Rekes, I want to come to you though uh, because you did mention uh, the whole question of industrial uh, uh, cooperation and of course part of the question that was asked uh, during the press conference for uh, Foreign Minister Wong Yu was how exactly uh, Africa would be impacted by uh, China's economic transition especially the 10 points plan as announced by President Xi in December. Is there a concern though from Africa on this? Right, I think there will be lots of interesting, these are very interesting times in the sense that um, they just concluded uh, NPC, National um, uh, People's Congress, and uh, the CPPCC, you know, the, the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, have actually touched on the 13th five-year plan, which is uh, for China, which is uh, 2016 to 2020. Now, in uh, this plan, they are reconfiguring the economy f away from what has generally been called the uh, new normal to the new uh, economics, as uh, Premier Li uh, mentioned uh, on Wednesday. And essentially, this means that uh, China is going to take some of its overcapacity industrial units and manufacturing units in places such as uh, Fujian and Guangdong provinces and uh, places uh, such as Georgian province uh, to other countries and Africa is a target 
for the transfer of uh, these industries. Now, China has already uh, kind of sorted out its industrial base. It is an industrial power. It is actually the leading manufacturing country in the world. The, uh, Africa, on the other hand, has not really seen to the conclusion or even started in some sense right. its industrial revolution. So Africa is very welcoming of uh, these uh, new industrial units that, will, uh, that, uh, that uh, China wants to uh, take elsewhere. Um, <coughs> and therefore, there's a link between the 13th uh, five-year plan and the FOCAC uh, action plans on industrialization. Don't forget that in December, when the leaders met here in Johannesburg, right. one of the action plans specifically mentioned that China is going to put aside 10 billion US dollars uh, for the China Africa Industrialization Fund. So uh, the fact that uh, the transfer of, of a capacity industries from China is going to come to Africa is something that is going to be of great benefit for Africa's industrial uh, you know, revolution that has never really happened. Um, wh one of the key areas... I'm going to jump to in there, uh, uh, Dr. Wekesa, because, uh, Professor, uh, as you listen to that, though, and, and a lot has been talked about yes. Africa's industrial base and, and industrializing Africa, but where have been the obstacles, though? What does Africa need to do, though, to attract that Chinese investment and that Chinese industrial cooperation? Well, the, we need uh, political will decisiveness. Uh, the indications from the Chinese side is that they are willing to invest in selected industries, uh, the production in China itself. Some of the industries are becoming expensive to run in China and they would like to transfer those activities to some other areas that may be more reasonable in terms of prices and uh, they have in some instances they put up a shoe factory in Ethiopia and I know they are willing to put up some industries in Kenya of different types uh, they are already trying in some places in Ivasha so the it is a question of the determination the will the political will of the country is concerned because there has to be an agreement between the Chinese officials and the African officials that it is a good thing to do and once they agree the, the others are details that can be worked out very quickly as to the land, the lease, the how long it is, going, what is it that is being invested, and uh, what are the understanding in terms of training. So the, the prospects are bright, and there are a lot of things that can be done in Africa more reasonably than in China. And what is going on is that the Chinese themselves have come to that conclusion, that they can do those things in Africa much better, faster, and with more benefits spreading all over. And with that, then you come to the point of assisting the various African countries to put their industries uh, up, value addition in some things, even if it is a question of cattle, uh, slaughtering cattle, packaging the meat, sending it there. These things are doable. Right. And it's a question, it's, a it's an issue of political will uh, between the two sides. Political will, though. Dr. Yao, of course, uh, African countries are going to be wondering how they can make themselves more uh, attractive as uh, investment destinations for China's industrialization outflow. Uh, of course, given the fact that other Asian countries have proximity and better infrastructure than Africa, how do you think Africa can make itself more attractive? Well, uh, according to China's experience, if a country never constructs its own independent uh, industry, and never lead these people to learn how to construct their own industry with their own hands, but always, uh, you know, rely on uh, selling resources or even attached to some big powers. There will be problems sooner or later. That's why, at the end of last year, President Xi Jinping proposed the ten major cooperation plans. Uh, I think the uh, most important uh, feature of all these plans is the same. That is to uh, enhance the capacity of self-development and to boost the industrialization process of all African countries. So I think African countries, uh, government people should be prepared for that and to realize that independent, independent industry is so, so, so important.
for themselves. All right. Uh, Dr. Wekasa, of course, uh, the foreign minister did mention that uh, following up on Fokaka, he has been to about 20 African countries following up on the developments after uh, Fokaka. Do you see Africa leveraging that initiative? Right, definitely. So, I mean, um, uh, there, there are gaps in that, um, truth be told, uh, China is very focused and uh, the Chinese uh, politicians and leaders and uh, policy makers and managers kind of uh, follow their words with action and make things happen. Uh, African countries, like Professor Masharia said earlier, need to follow up uh, their policies with action. And, and therefore the onus is on, uh, on, on Africans really to take advantage of uh, the policies and look at where there is uh, connectivity with their own uh, development plans and so forth. Um, from a continental perspective, we have the Africa Union which is, uh, came up with the uh, Agenda 2063. At the global level, we have the UN uh, you know, Sustainable Development Goals or Sustainable Development Agenda 2030. Uh, and, and all these are very brilliant um, policy statements and so forth. But to what extent do we see the policies being implemented or are they just, uh, you know, policies on paper without very little implementation? I think this is one area where African countries can learn from China in that put very brilliant ideas on paper in terms of uh, development plans such as Kenya's uh, Innovation 2030 or South Africa similar uh, policies. In fact, almost every African country has a vision something, you know, vision 2030, vision 2040 or something. To what extent are they willing to walk the talk and learn from China in terms of implementing uh, some of these policies? In fact, just as a quick uh, point on this, the Chinese are so serious that they have already start implement, started implementing some of the industrial plans, even before the FOCAC industrialization action plan was put in place. We look at manufacturing right. units by companies such as Photon, such as FAW. We look at special economic zones in places such as Nigeria. Nigeria actually has two, one in Lekki, one in Lagos. Lagos. We have one in, uh, in, in, uh, in Zambia. And uh, we, have, uh, we, we are told many other countries are lined up for the same. Mauritius also has a uh, special economic zone. So I think the idea of Africans moving on to create uh, situations where these policies can be really, really implemented is the next level of uh, consideration. And uh, we'll leave it there uh, for the moment. That's all we have time for this week. But thank you to all my guests for their insights in Johannesburg. Dr. Bob Wakesa, he's a research associate at the University of the Witwatersrand in Beijing. Dr. Yao Yao, he's a director of research at China's Public Diplomacy Association. And in Nairobi with me, Professor Mashara Munena. Thank you very much thank for you. joining in this uh, conversation. Remember to join the conversation online through Facebook. Twitter and YouTube and do join us again next week for another edition of Talk Africa. Goodbye.